everyone, and welcome back to the Dwarven Tavern. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Goins, and this is going to be a continuance, though far from a conclusion, to the uh, second edition Pathfinder rules going for uh, $59.99 at uh, your favorite stores, or maybe less so at your favorite stores, which is probably why they're your favorite. Would be mine. Um, this time we are going to talk about... Uh, chapter 9, which is playing the game. Now, I have mixed emotions about that uh, myself. Not really. I, I think it's a good thing regardless, because if you're a beginner, of course, this is this is need to know. And, uh, you know, if you don't know what to do, how to run a game, how to play the game, uh, then this is invaluable. So I would say, you know, for this to, uh, to new players is pure gold. And uh, I guess what the real question is, is not whether it's necessary, but whether it's, uh, it's valuable, uh, whether it's written well, whether it's, it contains uh, good information, and so forth. So let's take a look, shall we? This book, um, it says, at this point, the, the chapter heading, at this point, you have a character and are ready to play Pathfinder, or maybe you're a GM and you're ready to run your first adventure. Either way, this chapter provides uh, the full details for the rules outlined in Chapter 1 Introduction. This chapter begins by describing the general rules and conventions of how the game is played, and then presents more in-depth explanation of the rules for each mode of play. What are modes of play, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. In time. Not right now. We're going to go through this uh, linearly. It, it talks about the general rules, and it tells you what you what you need to understand before it goes into what it is. So it says, to one degree or another, these rules are used in every every mode of play. Making choices, of course. You know, if you're a veteran, you know. I don't necessarily mean a veteran. Thank you for your service. I mean, if you're a veteran gamer or a gamer veteran. If you've played the game a long time, uh, then you know that it's all about choices. What choices do you have to make as a player? What choices do you have to make as a dungeon master? And when I say have to make, I don't mean you have to make those choices. I mean, what choices do you have that needed to be made? And of course, you know, choices lead to consequences, and consequences lead to sink or swim, basically. And we know that. And uh, when you make choices, you sometimes need to make checks. This chapter goes over all of those things. It goes over when to make a check, uh, when success isn't certain, whether you're swinging a sword at a foul beast attempting to leap across a chasm, as my buddy Gary would say, or uh, straining to remember the name of the Earl's second cousin <laughs> at a soiree. Oh, yeah, it's your cousin. Zipnorg. Nope, that's Bob. You you have to attempt to check. Now, now here's where we differ a little bit in opinion. If you've ever gone to take a drink of liquid <laughs> and choked on it or pulled the glass away before you finished drinking, pouring, and it goes all over your front, or any number of a large number of stupid mistakes that are possible to be made that I have personally made more than once. Um, you can understand why under certain circumstances, rolling a check for mundane actions can be fun. And, you know, normally I say a one, you know, a roll of one will fail because there, there is a very slim chance that you'll accidentally stick yourself in the eye with a fork if you try to adjust your glasses while you're eating. <laughs> and yes, I have. So that's that's rolling a one. Doing that all the time is not, it's not cool. Uh, that will really intensify the, uh, the dullness of the game. But it can be fun in certain circumstances. You know, it's like the, the Roger Rabbit principle, only when it's funny. You don't have to do it when it's it's vitally important. And you, you don't have to do it all the time. It's just, you know, some things. Uh, and it also depends on the attitude of the player. If the player says, you know, well, I'll go over there. I'll just walk over there and open that window. And um, I, as a dungeon master, must get comfy. Yeah, I know you love them. I, as a dungeon master, must curtail the cockiness by 
uh, making them roll and possibly humbling their nonchalant bourgeoisie attitude. So that's when the that's when the check comes in. If they make it, they make it. That's great. If not, a, the consequences don't have to be dire. The consequences of a fumbling of a mundane action could be something as simple as some of the things I mentioned. You know, poke yourself in the eye with a fork. You don't take any damage, but you look dumb as hell, and and so forth. So. So take those checks, uh, use those checks as a tool to, to uh, flavor your game uh, with, with humor and other things that are not critical. And, you know, I've, been, I've always been a serious gamer. I thought that the, one of my players that used a, his bard used an electric guitar uh, and every time he played Ramon's songs that fired a cone of cold. I, I, you know, some people might think that's cool. I thought that was dumb as shit. I thought that was the dumbest freaking thing I've ever, I hated it. Because, you know, electric guitars in a fantasy world, just that alone, you know, I wasn't into the, uh, I wasn't into the anachronisms or the Ramones. And forgive me if you like Ramones. I'm, I'm not saying that the Ramones are bad. I don't care for them. It's not my brand of, uh, it's not my flavor. But, you know, that particular context it was it didn't fit my game number one if you want to have a game like that yeah i mean and it's all about individual choices so back to my original point uh you don't have to make it all serious all the time and if your game is more of a of a comedy or a humor flavor you don't have to uh create uh games for just for comic relief if you have the comic relief built into your game, it's reasonable. I've seen a lot of games, uh, you know, gamers streaming really asinine and, and kind of stupid quests, like the quest for the magic meatball and stuff like that. I, yeah, that's all right. I mean, if that's your bag, yeah. But take the event, the Avengers series, uh, the the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Humor throughout. There was, there was a lot of humor in the Lord of the Rings movie throughout, but it, the whole over the overarching uh, thing was uh, theme was was quite serious. But they had enough humor in it to make it fun, and uh, that's what I suggest with with the uh, with the occasional checks to uh, ensure no stupid mistakes or to increase the chance of stupid mistakes to, to keep everybody humble. You know, you, you can't just automatically do something. You know, taking 10 or taking 20 or whatever, that's, that's a different story. But, and also having the advantage or disadvantage like in here is also a different story. You know, you're less likely to fumble at a, at a, with, a mundane, with a mundane task. My kitty cat just loves the attention. She loves coming down here when I'm recording. And what can you do? So. Uh, one thing that uh, the book states that I kind of disagree with, but not really. Um, it's it's just like I agree with you know how to do the checks and you know it's well it's well written, it makes sense. But I'm just suggesting add add checks a little more often uh, to spice things up a little bit. It increases the 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 chance for fun, but it also decreases uh, the amount of just unending inane and mundane actions. So, so yeah, if, if somebody has a plus 30 to pickpocket and they try and steal somebody's pants or whatever, uh, you make them roll that. Uh, some of the game conventions that it mentions, the GM has the final say. True. Uh, specific overrides general, which is another good rule, which is very true. The, uh, the general rules, and it, one, it's good to, it'll be good to bring this up. Uh, a core principle of Pathfinder is that the specific rules override general ones. If two rules conflict, the more specific one takes precedence. If there's still ambiguity, the GM determines which rule to use. For example, these examples are good, so it's another plus. The rules state that when attacking a concealed creature, you must attempt a DC-5 flat check to determine if you hit. Flat checks don't benefit from modifiers, bonuses, or penalties. It's a flat check. It just... A raw roll. But an ability that's specifically designed to overcome concealment might override and alter this. If a rule doesn't specify other, otherwise, default to the general rules presented in this chapter. While some special rules may also state the normal rules to provide context, you should always default to the normal rules even if you don't specifically, even if the effects don't specifically say so. So, what that means to me is if you 
have a, an ambiguous, a large ambiguous rule, and you have a, a condition or a thing that is very specifically overcomes that rule, like the firing into uh, cover or concealment, then, yeah, the specific overrides the general. And I can't really think of anything offhand that additional to that. I think it's a pretty good example. But I, I agree with that. Rounding. You may need to calculate a fraction of the value, like having damage. Always round down because of the, unless otherwise specified. For example, if a spell deals seven damage and a creature takes half, then the creature takes three because you can't take three and a half points of damage. You can, but for, for simplicity's sake, if you don't want to say, but I took 15 and, and 37 60 fourths damage. And that means that I have, and then you start calculating, and it's like, it means I have 12 and 11 thirteenths left. So, yeah, yeah, it's not, that that would slow down the game. Uh, multiplying, when more than one effect would multiply the time by the number, the same number don't multiply more than once. For example, uh, each multiple of one, if one ability doubled the duration, one of your spells and another one doubled the duration for the same spell, you would triple the, spe the duration. One times one times one <laughs> is one. <sighs> Math. I was an English guy. If it doubles once, then doubles again, and it, you don't get plus, you don't get times four. You get doubles the original number once, and then doubles the original number again. So it gives you times three and not times four. Duplicate effects, only one instance applies, using a higher level for the effects. If you were using mage armor and then cast it again, you would benefit from only one casting of the spell. Casting a spell again on the same target might get you a better duration or effect if it were cast at a higher level than the second, but otherwise gives you no advantage. It's like getting invisibility cast on you twice. You can't be more invisible than you were. Although... You know, some of those spells, like, I don't know, the the Tenzer's Transformation, it would be, you know, kind of ridiculous if a, if a wizard could cast that on himself five times and get, you know, multiply the effects by five. So, yeah, and then ambiguous rules. If one version is too good to be true, it probably is. A rule seems to have wording with problematic repercussions or doesn't work as intended. Work with your group to find a good solution rather than just playing the rule as printed. Which has always been really cool about the Pathfinder stuff and, and Paizo in general is that they put fun ahead of everything else. And these rules were not intended to generate arguments. These rules were intended to make you have fun or to allow you to facilitate your enjoyment, not to... Not to cause conflict so and they also say you know if you don't like a rule arbitrate it you know the more of a set of guidelines as it were yeah so uh then it tells all the stuff about how to make a check roll the d20 and identify the modifier bonuses and penalties that apply then it talks about proficiency rank and the bonuses thereof now that's a new thing to pathfinder second edition that you are trained uh, untrained trained expert master and legendary which uh, the proficiency bonus for trained is your level plus two, expert your level plus four, master your level plus six, and legendary is your level plus eight. Which I, I really like that. I really like that rule. Then it goes on to explain all the rest of the stuff, all the steps. Uh, the first is roll a d20. Second step is calculate the result, of course. Uh, compare the result to the DC, and calculating DCs is another thing that's always kind of given me fits. Uh, calculating DCs. Whenever you attempt to check, you compare your results against the DC. When someone or something else attempts to check against you rather than both forces rolling against one another, the GM or player, if the opponent is another PC, compares the result to a fixed DC based on your relevant statistic. Your DC for a given statistic is 10 plus the total modifier for that statistic. Now, if you have ever played Silver Age Sentinels, uh, they, have an, a, they have a thing called a defense roll, which in reality they pointed out in, this, in these rules, and it's the same thing here in this, is that if you make a defense roll, it's the same as an attack roll. You've got, uh, you've got all of your modifiers, then you have your roll, your d20 roll, then you have your result, which is these two things added up. When you have a defense roll, it's the same thing. 
When you don't do an offense roll, your armor class is 10, plus your your bonuses or penalties, right? So what that essentially is doing is you are you are taking 10 on your defense, on your armor class. Your armor class 10, that's a taking 10 on defense. Plain and simple. This is taking a 10 on your on your opposed roll. I like the opposed rolls uh, better myself, more. I like that more. Uh, however, if you want to do it this way, there's nothing wrong with doing it either way. You can do it in two different ways in the same game if you want, uh, if the variables are great enough. Because there are some instances in which if something, if I want something to be random, I'll roll percental dice, and then to get the base number, the percent chance of that happening, or that item being there or whatever, I'll roll percental dice to get a random number, and then I'll roll under that on a second roll. It's straightforward, and that's that's as random as you can get. So, and I know a lot of my players have adopted that uh, that policy, that practice for times which they can't decide what to do. It's like, what would my character do in this position? Would he attack? Would he befriend? Would he eat a sandwich? What 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 would he do? I just don't even know. So they roll. They say, well, okay, here's my thing. If I want to, if I want to attack this dude for saying that, and then he rolls percental dice, you can add modifiers to it as you want because it's your character and it doesn't really affect anything but your choices. So there is that. And as a dungeon master, I've done that too. If, if you don't know what a character is going to do, roll to see what they're going to do. Think of what a, a one possibility. I am hostile. What are the chances of me being hostile? You roll the dice. It's all oh, 37. Then you roll the dice again. If it's under 37, you're hostile. If it's not, then then you're not. So it makes it really, you know. And if it's within the, the, the boundaries, the parameters of the character's uh, behavior possibilities. Step four, determine the, determine the degrees of success and effect, which is, uh, is a thing of this uh, game in particular. Natural 20 always succeeds, and it says uh, if you're going up against a very high DC, you might get only successful natural 20, or even a failure if 20 plus your total modifier is 10 or below the DC. So there are some situations that you simply cannot win, like jumping across the Canyon Grand, and uh, you know no matter how many natural 20s you roll, you're not gonna you're not gonna succeed at that. Nat 20, boing. No, it's not real. I mean. Let's let's get real. That's not real. So if your modifier is too high, adding it to a one from your D20 roll succeeds by ten or more. You can succeed even if you roll a natural one. I'm not really sure if I agree with that. You, I don't believe in cannot fail. I believe in cannot succeed. I, maybe I'm a defeatist. I don't know. What do you think? But uh, if you roll a one, there's always a chance that that you're gonna blow it. Even if it's so, you know, I step over a, uh, I step over an anthill. Well, roll, I roll a one. You tripped. Plain and simple. If a feat, a magic item, spell, or other effect is not listed, critical success or failure, treat it as an ordinary success or failure instead. So this this system is is fraught with uh, critical successes and and failures, which I like to call fumbles because I'm old skew like that. Specific checks like attack rolls. It covers, covers quite well. Melee attack rolls, a d20, plus your strength, plus proficiency bonus, plus other bonuses, plus penalties, which penalties would be a negative number. So you add a negative number to get less. Then range attack is d20, plus dexterity mod, plus proficiency bonus, plus other bonuses, plus penalties. Bye, Zena. Then it talks about multiple attacks. If you make one more attacks beyond your first in a single turn, less accurate you become, which is true, unless you're trained. So I like that. If you, you So even a, you know, even a, a novice swordsman can, <laughs> without much chance of, of hitting. So, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, then it talks about range penalties, armor classes, pretty standard stuff. Uh, spell attack roll, which is, is a relatively new concept. Uh, ranged touch attack. Uh, striding and striking is a thing. Perception checks are a thing. It covers that. And, you know, I'm not going to read the entire book to you because I, this is a review, not a recitation, a recital. 
recitation. Yeah, I guess. Uh, then it has a variety of skills, even though the, the list of skills are very s small compared to 3.5. Uh, then it talks about flat checks, where you roll something without any modifiers. It's a flat check. Been, we've been doing that for some time in the, our 3.5 games. Uh, secret checks, of course, is something that a dungeon master has to make. A GM, game master. Melee damage, die of the weapon, or unarmed attack, strength modifier, and bonuses, and penalties. Range is a damage that I have a weapon, strength modifier for thrown weapons, bonuses, and penalties. I always allow to use dexterity bonus as well because if you are quicker of hand-eye coordination, then your, your aim is better. Or maybe even if your wisdom is higher, you can add that because wisdom is the same as perception. Yeah, because the perception check is a D20 plus your wisdom mod plus proficiency bonus plus other bonuses and penalties. So you could you could stack those on if you wanted because it th and I I did an entire video about this um, earlier is that thrown weapons and missiles fired from bows and crossbows and stuff are far deadlier than than melee weapons. When you attack someone with a melee weapon, you have to attack them with a great sword or double-bitted axe or a club of preposterous size. But when you shoot someone with an arrow, <laughs> they are they're actually more likely to die. And it's a stick. It's a little tiny stick. It's like a pencil with a metal head. And so you wouldn't charge into melee with an arrow unless you, you know, Legolas or Stabby McPoken Pants. But the, the point is, is that uh, that ranged weapons, it would be okay to uh, to stack those things because they are naturally more deadly. Plus, I use the uh, the D twenty Mafia rules for uh, determining a critical hit with a missile weapon. Uh, I loved the D twenty Mafia book and Tony Di Girolamo, uh, which I took me forever to learn how to say his name, which I may have still got it wrong. But uh, that notwithstanding, if you if you're rolls add up to 20. It's not doesn't have to be a natural 20 to make it a critical for a missile weapon because missile weapons are inherently more dangerous and and subsequently more deadly. So um, yeah, there, there you go. That's 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 my that's my own house rule. You can take that. But you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So while players enjoy that deadly missile weapons, they've got crap being hurled at them as well. So Make them aware of that <laughs> if, if uh, you don't want somebody to walk out mad, or maybe you do, and that's this is the opportunity to make that happen. So, um, determine damage type and the traits thereof, like Flaming Rune is active, uh, gains the fire trait, so forth and so on, electricity, cold, and sonic, and acid, and boogers. So then you apply the target's immunities, weaknesses, and resistances, if they have any, like, you know, you wouldn't want a red dragon, fireball! It's like, you're not, oh, alive anymore, are you? Uh, then there's a sidebar with uh, physical damage, energy damage, mental poison, bleed, precision, alignment, and precious, no, that precious material damage. Like, oh my god, uh, merchants beware, this guy does coin damage. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. Uh, while their own damage category, precious materials can modify damage to penetrate a creature's resistance, such as silver and werewolves, vampires too, traditionally, and uh, adamantium with hardness and so forth and so on. Uh, then it goes on to, can, to uh, cover if the damage re remains, reduce the target's hit points, meaning if the, if after you calculate its resistances and immunities and they're still damaged, then you subtract its hit point. Now, now for those experienced, that's pretty straightforward and kind of a review. So, and we, we know, we know that already, right? Uh, however, newbies may not know that. And it's a good, it's a good organization to make things flow and making the game flow is what's important. So then it goes, it has this entire list of conditions, which I think is incredibly cool. Uh, blinded, broken, clumsy, concealed, confused, controlled, dazzled, deaf and doomed, drained, dying, and covered, and feebled, and so forth. It's got a whole list of conditions. So if you have any, uh, if 
some things might apply this condition to you, like a bonk upon the head. You may be confused or stunned, or stupefied or unconscious. You could gain any of those traits potentially. It's a status effect if you're more into the video game terminology. Uh, then it's got duration, range, and reach targets areas with a lovely little chart here on page 456 it talks about all the different areas burst cone emanation line an emanation comma line <laughs> line of effect line of sight the format of afflictions hit points healing and dying knocked out and dying recovery checks so what is a recovery check? When you're dying, at the start of each of your turns, you must attempt a flat check with a DC equal to 10 plus your current dying value to see if you get better or worse. It's called a recovery check. The effects of this check are as follows. Critical success, your dying value is reduced by 2. The success, your dying value is reduced by 1. Failure, your dying value increases by 1. The critical failure, it's increased by 2, of course. So, if your value ever reaches 4, not negative 10 like it used to be, if your dying value reaches 4, you die. Uh, so, in some ways, it's a little better, and in some ways, it's not. I mean, before, in older versions of other games, uh, when you get 0, you start losing 1 hit point per round until you reach negative 10 and then you die well this is not quite as simple but it is it's actually simpler in some ways so there you go uh let's see what else is in this chapter that i wanted to mention death of course is dying uh massive damage you die instantly if you ever take damage equal to or greater than double your maximum hit points in one blow no shit i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry double your maximum hit points in one blow well yeah that's their, that's their definition of massive damage, which I'm trying to see if there's any way I could be reading this other than the way I think it means. If you take damage equal to or greater than double your maximum hit points in one blow, you're instantly dead. How could you, how could you not know that? How could it not be that way? That is massive damage. If a dragon has a hundred hit points, a tiny dragon, and you do 200 points of damage to him, yeah, he's going to be dead. So that's, that's silly. Kind of a the, the incredibly obvious death effects and instant death. If you are re reduced to zero hit points by death effect, you're slain instantly without reach, needing to reach dying for. Good to know. Items and hit points. It's on page 272. Then it goes on to mention actions like uh, grabbing an edge as a reaction to reduce the damage from a fall or eliminate it or avoid it. If you can grab onto a thing, you can grab an edge if there's an edge available, and that's for your GM to decide. If you fall onto water, snow, or other relatively soft substance, water is not necessarily a soft substance. As uh, You can treat the fall as if it were 20 feet shorter or 30 feet shorter if you intentionally dove into it. Okay, that's cool. Uh, let's see, what else? Falling on a creature, that hurts. Perception and the conditions thereof. Senses, precise, imprecise, and vague. You've seen, you seem to think, you feel that there's something awry. Why that? You have an arrow sticking out of your face. You sense that something is amiss. It covers special senses like low light vision, dark vision, how to detecting creatures, observed, hidden, and undetected, and unnoticed. Goes over concealment and invisibility, hero points, and heroic deeds. It covers that as well. So those are good things to mention. Those are good things to have. Encounter mode. Every individual encounter action counts. You enter the encounter mode of play. In this mode, time is divided into rounds, each of which is six seconds of time in the game world every round. Each participant takes a turn in an established order. Uh, during your turn, you can you can use actions, and depending on the details of the encounter, you might have an oppor the opportunity to use reactions to free actions, blah, blah, blah. And then it describes them. Basic actions. And it has an actual list of actions, like skills, that tells exactly what actions that your characters can do, like stand, step, stride, leap, interact, crawl, press F, interact, 
drop prone, escape, release, seek. This might seem silly to the experienced gamer, but after thinking about it for a while, because I, you know, I read this some time ago, after thinking about it a while, and it tells you how many actions that you that it needs to to do that, like point out, mount, fly, grab an edge as an instant or a reaction, uh, which is similar. Burrow <laughs> aid is a reaction. So you can't just aid somebody if they haven't done something that requires aid. So yeah, uh, I, I think that these are these are a very good thing because if someone doesn't know exactly what they can do, then it helps to have a list of things that they could possibly do. So I, I think it's a good thing. Plus pointing out, you know, raising a shield and so forth. I raise my shield. Uh, trigger, move actions to trigger, forced movement, moving through a creature's space, flanking, all those things are covered with combat, and that covers the the general uh, encounter mode, mountain combat, aquatic combat, and aerial combat, and so forth, and all of the, the consequences thereof. Then it goes into exploration mode, which is traveling by horseback, uh, free form, and the various things, walking on my book. Little one. Equip the cat. Walk, uh, scouting, uh, searching, hustling, investigate, repeat a spell, and so forth are all things that you can do in exploration mode that uh, go over the course of hours or even days. Then downtime mode is things that you can do, like long-term rest for wizards and other such beings. Uh, retraining offers a way to uh, alter some of their choices. So you can retrain certain things, which is very cool. Feats and skills and class features. And then other downtime activities like crafting and managing a business, becoming part of a guild, other things like that that don't necessarily require uh, an intense amount of role playing, but does require your characters to make choices. So with this chapter, this chapter is, I, I'm gonna maintain its five acts streak uh, because it's, it's, it's a good chapter and it has a lot of good things for uh, novice and pro, pro uh, adventurer alike, gamer, GMs as well. And it has a lot of good tips and a lot of good tricks and a lot of uh, good advice that is will be yours to modify as you see fit you know if you don't want uh things to stack in a certain way or whatever that's that's your game and it's your your option to do so and they say that continuously throughout the book that these are a, more of a set of guidelines so it's a very good uh, very good chapter so with that being said uh this is again this is the core rule book for pathfinder second edition from from paizo dot com slash pathfinder and uh, it goes for what did i say it was 59 I, I don't know why i can't remember that 60 bucks minus a penny and uh so so yeah it's it's probably going to be my new go-to game once we get all of our 3.5 campaigns finished i'm probably going to have to uh make the players roll up some second ed pathfinder pf second e pf 2e poof 2e <laughs> So anyway, uh, with that being said, on behalf of the entire cast and the crew of the Dwarven Tavern, I am your host, Dr. Jeff Goins, wishing you to want for nothing but adventure. And at first I feared it, then we charged. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. Let the